morning. Good morning. Welcome to all of you in the name of our Savior Jesus. Our service theme for this morning is Resurrection Reality. We have a meaningful message to share. The season of Easter is about sharing the blessings of the resurrection. Last week we talked about the blessing of proof and peace that gives us confidence Christ is risen and that it gives us peace for our lives now and in eternity. Today we're focusing on how the resurrection is such a blessing that it must be shared with everyone we can and shared the world around. That's the theme that you're going to see running through our readings for today. As he came in, hopefully you picked up a service folder. The service folder has everything you need for order of service and hymns, everything else we're doing here today. We've got a special guest preacher this morning. Mr. Justin Schrader is here with us from Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. If you were here with us last spring, he was here with us last spring. You maybe remember the story. We got to know each other when I was a vicar for his father in Georgia. So we're very glad to have you here, Justin. Looking forward to hearing from you. To begin our service, we will sing hymn 742 on Galilee's High Mountain. That's printed on page 13 in your service folder. God bless your worship.
please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in him will live, even though they die. And those who live by believing in him will never die. I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth. Since you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, we will appear with him in glory. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, he has risen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the day the Lord has made. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We'll listen to our inspiration choir sing, Christ is risen. Thank you, friends. Please stand, then, and we continue with our confession of sins. <coughs> Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed are they whose sin the Lord does not count against them. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Almighty and merciful Father, we have strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed what we have devised and desired in our hearts. We have offended you and sinned against your holy law. We have done those things that we should not have done, and we have not done those things that we should have done. Have mercy on us, Lord. Spare us, forgive us, and restore us. 
according to your promises in Christ Jesus. God, our merciful Father, has forgiven all our sins. He sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Redeemer and Savior. Jesus paid the penalty for our guilt by his death on the cross and freed us from death by his resurrection from the grave. We have peace with God now and forever. Amen. Amen. We sing together. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Our first lesson from God's Word for today comes from the New Testament book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 11 through 20. Peter and John had just healed a crippled beggar miraculously by the power of Jesus' name. Well, as a large crowd gathered there to find out what was going on, Peter used the opportunity to share a meaningful message about the healing from sin and death that comes through faith in our crucified and risen Christ. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. 
You killed the righteous one. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent, then, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. The word of the Lord. We continue with our psalm of the day that begins on the bottom of page 6. Let's sing it together. second lesson from God's Word for today comes from the New Testament book of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. This reading is the sermon text. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, But we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? 
For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Then please stand for the gospel acclamation. First John chapter 1 verse 7 and chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 teaches us that the meaningful message we have to share is a message of forgiveness from Jesus who died to atone for our sins and who now lives to intercede for us in heaven. Let's speak it responsibly as it's written. The blood of Jesus God's Son purifies us from all sin. If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. He is the only sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Then our gospel lesson for today comes from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 49. As Jesus stood before his disciples on this first Easter evening, he had two meaningful messages to share. First, he really was risen again, alive and well, in flesh and blood. And therefore, second, the world needs to hear the message of repentance, forgiveness, and life in his name. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Our hymn of the day is hymn 459, Christ the Lord is Risen Again, on page 14.
what kind of hope do you have? Have you thought about how often you hear, use, or say that word, hope? Sometimes we use hope to talk about an uncertain guess at a future or a wish that we might have, like, I hope I get off work early today. I say that one a lot at my part-time job. <laughs> There's a chance it'll happen, but it's unlikely, right? Other times we use hope in that uh, Disney wish on a star kind of way when we want an impossible wish to happen, like, I hope I pass my test tomorrow but I haven't studied at all, and I haven't been paying attention in class. Or, I hope she agrees to go out with me, but I don't stand a crying chance. We use hope in a variety of ways, but none of them has any true confidence behind them. However, in the second lesson, Romans 5, Paul outlines a hope that is fundamentally different than the way the world uses hope. He outlines a hope that has the utmost confidence behind it. He tells you about a hope you can boast about, and this is how he begins. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. With this brief yet beautiful statement, Paul outlines the entirety of what we call justification. And justification, simply put, is being declared righteous or not guilty in God's sight. And maybe it helps to think about it this way. You were the defendant in a courtroom. God was the judge and the devil was the prosecutor. The devil is throwing accusation after accusation after accusation against you. And he's got ammunition. He's armed with every single thing you've ever done wrong. Every sin you've ever committed, every lie told, every drunken night, every lustful thought, every friend betrayed, even those things that hide in the darkest corners of your heart that you thought only you knew, he's bringing those to light and using them against you. Everything in that courtroom pointed to a guilty verdict. Yet, God, in his great mercy, said, in my eyes you have done nothing wrong because of my son, because of Jesus, because of his life and his death, you are innocent. If we thought for one second that we could do anything, if we thought our hope for peace with God depended on something we had done, one minute back in that courtroom, one look at the transcripts would prove we would have no hope of peace at all. We might as well wish on a star. But that's not the case. With that short phrase, we have been justified. God communicates to you that the verdict has been handed down and you have been exonerated. And what Paul is doing is telling those Roman Christians reading this letter 2,000 years ago and telling you, the modern Christian, sitting in a pew on a Sunday morning in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, what your identity is. Your identity is as a justified child of God, a believer. And that's an identity you can be proud of, an identity you can boast about. And because you are a justified believer, a child of God, you are now at peace with God. And to be clear, this isn't a transitory peace, like a Sunday afternoon nap watching the Masters today, or a transitory peace like an uneasy alliance between recently warring nations. No, this is lasting peace. This is permanent peace. This is the kind of peace that Jesus told his disciples the world cannot give you. No amount of financial security, no level of social standing will ever give you the peace that you have because of your Savior Jesus the peace you have with God. And this peace was bought through Jesus. That's why Paul writes, we have now been justified by his blood. Every terrible temptation endured, every brutal and bruising blow, every blood-soaked step on the way to the cross until he was finally lifted up, all that Jesus did for you so that you could enjoy peace with God. That is how much you were worth to Jesus, his very life. You and I boast because we are justified. And we don't only boast because we are justified, we boast because we have peace with God. And that peace was hard-earned. 
And we also boast because we know what we once were. We know we are no longer God's enemies. This is how Paul makes that abundantly clear. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. You and I were powerless to do anything for ourselves. You and I were ungodly. We were doing everything opposite to God's law. In fact, Paul says that we were working against it, actively scorning God and his will. But do you notice the tense of those verbs? We were those things, but we are no longer now. That way of life is in the past because Christ has redeemed you from your old way of life. That is what it means to be no longer God's enemies. That is what it means to be a believer. So, can you not help but smile from ear to ear? Can you not help but rejoice knowing that you're a believer, you're justified, you're at peace with God, and you're no longer his enemy? Or, do you, like me, hear Paul's words, and you pause? I know, I know and I confess that Jesus died for me. I know that I'm at peace with God, but what about, what about when it doesn't feel that way? I mean, I know the person looking back in the mirror at me at the end of the day. I know who I am. I know the things that I do when I'm alone. I know the things that I say about her behind her back. I know the way I treat the people that I supposedly love. What do I do when I don't feel like a Christian? What do I do when I think, how can I really be called God's child? You see, in the chapter following the second lesson, Romans 5 today, Paul outlines this struggle that we have. There is an ongoing battle in your life, and sometimes that battle is, in the Bible is called your battle with your sinful nature. Other times it's called your old Adam, a reference back to the fall of mankind at the Garden of Eden. But what's clear is there is a battle in the life of a believer. On one hand, we know that Jesus lived and died for us, that our sins are paid for. But on the other hand, our sins stand so clearly in front of us each and every day, we can't not see them. Luther put it this way, our old Adam was drowned in baptism, but he's a good swimmer. And he keeps bobbing back up into our lives each and every day, and we can't get rid of him. And that's the reality of life in a sinful world. Because you live in a sinful world, you will struggle with sin. But that's what makes Christ's sacrifice so special. That's what makes Christ's sacrifice so unique. That's why Paul says, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ didn't die for you because he knew you were going to be such a good person. Christ didn't die for you because he knew you were the super spouse, the perfect parent, the exemplary employee, the best student, I hate to tell you, but Christ didn't die for you because he knew you were going to be the one person to master the struggle against sin. But that is why Christ's sacrifice is so amazing. That is why you can't help but smile knowing that Christ didn't die for people who deserved it. Yet that is how much you were worth to Jesus. You were worth his life because he loved you, not because you deserved it. Yes, you and I struggle with sin, but our identity is not in the sins with which we struggle. Your identity is not defined by your sins. Your identity is defined by the God who loves you. Your identity is defined by the Savior who walked this earth for you, who lived for you, and who died for you. Your status is not based on whether you feel like a Christian when you wake up in the morning. Your status is based on <coughs> fact, the fact that Jesus lived, the fact that Jesus died, and the fact that Jesus lives again. You and I can boast because we know our hope isn't based on a feeling. It's based on facts. We read again, 
Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of glory. You and I stand in grace and like a shower it rains over us and washes us free from all our sins. And now we have hope. Hope of glory. And that glory is perfection with your Savior Jesus forever in heaven. This is what the Bible calls the wedding feast of the Lamb. A life so blessed, a life so joyous, a life so wonderful that the only thing that our minds can possibly compare it to are a wedding, an event so happy you can't think of anything else. But we can't even comprehend how amazing this life will be. That is what you have with Jesus. Not based on an uncertain guess, not based on an impossible wish, not based on a feeling, but based on fact that the Son of God died for you, the righteous for the unrighteous, to reconcile you to God. That's why Paul writes, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Christ's death was the payment for your sins, the securing of your justification, but Christ's life, Christ's life, his resurrection is the sign and seal that you and I too will rise. Easter's empty tomb is clear proof of that, that Christ has destroyed death. He has eliminated its dominion and it no longer rules. Now death only serves as the entrance to new life with Jesus forever. You and I boast because we know what hope we have, the hope of the heaven, the hope with Jesus of glory. And it's hope of future glory. And that's an important reminder that it is in the future because Paul says, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that our suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. While we live here on earth, we will suffer. That's why Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Being a Christian means you will face sufferings. Being a Christian means you will bear your cross. But you and I can bear those crosses proudly because we know who they connect us with. Your cross is intimately connected you with, connect you with Jesus. You and I wear those crosses as badges of honor because we know who first suffered in our place. Yes, we will suffer. Yes, we will bear our crosses. But just as a marathon runner endures mile after grueling mile and hour after grueling hour of training in order to reach their goal, so too do you and I face our troubles in this life because we know that they will produce perseverance, character, and finally, even more hope in future glory. And hope will never put us to shame because hope remembers what God has done for you. Hope relies ever more on the Jesus who lived and died and rose for you. Hope remembers that through a miracle of water and the word, God has adopted you into his kingdom and called you his child. That hope remembers that you and I are but strangers here, and that heaven is our real home. You see, Christian hope isn't just here for one season and gone for the next. Christian hope isn't just here for the happy times or the good times or the fun times or the easy times. No, Christian hope grows. It springs forth in suffering precisely because we know what it's based on. It's based on a Savior who loves you, a Savior who died for you, and a Savior who rose for you, and a Savior who says he's preparing a place for you where there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So you and I can boast. We can boast because we know we're justified. We know that it costs Jesus' his blood for that. We know we're at peace with God, and not some transitory peace, but a lasting peace, a permanent peace that the world cannot hope to offer. You and I boast because we're not God's enemies, but his dear children, And you and I boast because we know where our hope lies. It lies in Jesus and in heaven. So boast and keep on boasting because you have a future 
based in the fact that Jesus died for you and rose for you and that you will live with him forever in heaven, free from all guilt, always. Amen. Please stand. And let's confess together now our common Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed that's printed for you on page 9 in your service folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. We'll hear our St. Stephen's fifth and sixth graders singing, sing praise to the Lord, you people of grace.
Thank you, friends. We continue our worship then as our offerings are brought forward. As the offering is coming forward, let's sing the verse that's printed at the top of page 10 in your service folder. continue with our responsive prayer of the church. Lord of life, fill our hearts with joy during this Easter season, for you have risen and conquered the grave. Imprint the message of victory on our hearts and implant it in our minds. Through the good news of your resurrection, renew our hope and revive our faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By baptizing us into your name, you have connected us to your death and rising. You have put our sin to death and have given us a new life. Enable us each day to think of ourselves as dead to sin and alive to you, so that we may walk in newness of life in all we do. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In this fallen world, death and sorrow surround us. Touch the hearts of those who grieve the loss of a Christian they love. Direct their eyes to your empty tomb and ease their pain by reminding them that their loved ones will one day rise again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, many people grieve without hope. Let the message of resurrection reach them and awaken faith in their hearts. Use us as your instruments to bring the word of life to their souls and the message of hope to their hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Stay by the side of all who are suffering. In your wise mercy, heal those who are sick, receiving treatment for illness, recovering from illness or surgery, or hurting in body or mind. We pray especially for Sue Wilkie, who's dealing with complications from surgery recently. Remind them that your victory over death is a fact, and comfort them with your promise to raise them and give them and all believers new glorified bodies like yours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. Risen Savior, feed our faith with the message of your resurrection. Come to us in your word and in the feast of your sacrament to sustain and strengthen us until we feast with you in eternal glory. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn 451, See What a Morning. This is a new hymn to us, so we're going to have our inspiration choir introducing it for us. The first verse will be sung by a soloist. The entire choir will sing the second verse. The congregation is invited to join in singing the third verse.
Please stand for the closing prayer. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We join in the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. Our closing hymn is hymn 747, Christ High Ascended, on page 16 in your service book.
Good morning again to all of you. It's a pleasure to worship with you here today. Got some announcements on page 19 in your service folder. I want to add just a couple of things. First is we've got lots of snacks and refreshments back there with cookies and bars and so forth for everybody's here. Please stop by there and uh, let's enjoy some time together. Get your blood sugar up back there. Uh, this will be a good day together. And that's a good thing because if you have some extra time to stick around, and you would like to help us with things like uh, taking the window covers back to the storage room or taking down some tables and chairs from the gym um, or even taking down our Easter cross here now after this week. That would all be very much welcome. And then finally, Mr. Justin Schrader was here to preach for us. As I mentioned earlier, he was here last spring, so you've seen him two springs in a row now. He's in his second year at Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary, so next month. He is preparing for a, a vicar call. The vicar year in our ministerial training system is a year that you spend as a pastoral in, intern learning under an experienced pastor somewhere in the country. So next month, you'll be looking forward to finding out where you're going to spend that year. I'm sure you will do great. God's blessings to you. The month after that, he is getting married. And his fiance is here with us this morning, came all the way from New Ulm, Minnesota to be here with us this morning. So you know sometimes that when pastors preach, we use things from personal experience. He preached this morning about how God is gracious in fulfilling our hopes. And you mentioned specifically the girl who you asked to go out with you, but you know is out of your league. <laughs> so <clears throat> she's marrying him even with the mustache. So, so. That was me. That was me. Sorry, Justin. Sorry, Justin. But thank you for being here. God's blessings to you. We appreciate you being here sharing God's word with us. So uh, if you would like to support him, there is a box that is out there. I think on the right, you'll be able to find a box that says free will donation for Mr. Justin Schrader. If you'd like to support his ongoing training and the big things that are happening in his life, uh, you can drop some cash in there, and we will get it straight to him. Thank you again for being here. God bless your week.